So today we're going to be talking about copper and bronze. So we have to think about this a little bit. What is the difference between copper and bronze? Well, copper is this material, and it's sort of a reddish material, and it's an element in the periodic table. Bronze is this material, and it's an alloy. It means I've mixed my copper with something, all right? So they're two different materials, but have similar properties to begin with. So let's talk about them. Um, what are some of the properties of copper and bronze? Well, it's obviously metallic, and it turns out that copper is pretty malleable. It can bend fairly easily. It's opaque. It's uh, electrically conductive. In fact, it's extremely conductive, both electrically and thermally, so it will conduct heat. Um, it's shiny, and it's fairly hard. So these are properties of copper alloys and copper itself. All right, now, the melting point of pure copper is around 1100 degrees C. It was fairly high. It was named after where it came from, which was Cyprus. Um, and as I said, bronze is an alloy. Now bronze typically is an alloy in the, in ancient times, it was an alloy with either arsenic or tin. All right. And uh, it comes from the word, Italian word bronzo, which stood for bell metal. Uh, and it melting point is actually lower than copper. So this melts at a lower melting point than pure copper. All right, so why do we have a Bronze Age? All right, well, the early story of copper involved sort of this role in serendipity. It turns out that copper is actually probably one of the easiest metals to reduce from its oxidized state or its sulfidized state. And so that process was called smelting. And it turned out that copper was very easy to smelt. And so the way it was discovered um, is probably by accident, but um, it turns out that there's a green material called malachite that if you heat it up in a reducing ambient, like with some carbon, as you'll see in the demonstration, you can actually turn that malachite into copper. So we've been talking about copper and bronze, and one of the key questions would be, how do you actually make this stuff? Um, this is a sample of malachite, which is a copper carbonate sample. And, and this was one of the original ores that was used to make copper and bronze. Now, the key to making copper uh, ore is that this, because it's a copper carbonate, we have to get the carbonate out of it, or the CO3. Uh, and the way we do that is we're going to heat this up. Now, if you heat up malachite, then you can drive off the CO2, but that leaves you still with copper oxide. And so to reduce that copper oxide, you have to have a form of carbon monoxide. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this crucible, which is I've crudely made out of a piece of charcoal. When we heat that up, the charcoal is going to actually uh, decompose and form carbon monoxide. And that carbon monoxide then is going to help reduce the remaining copper oxide to just pure copper, or in this case, probably a copper with some impurities in it, whatever was in the malachite. So let's go ahead and try this. So what I've done is I've taken a piece of charcoal, carved up a little notch in it, and I've taken some of this malachite and flaked it off. So now I'm going to take a torch and start heating it up. And so to do that, I'm going to have to get this sample very, very hot. So I'm going to put on a glove to protect my hand. And we will start heating it. Now you can see fairly quickly that what happens is that the malachite is turning pretty quickly into a um, a reddish material. Now it usually takes a few seconds for the a few minutes actually for this to turn. There it goes, it's starting to react. You can tell it's reacting because it'll actually start to flow or bubble. There it goes. So now you can see in there there's a little puddle, and that puddle is actually copper. So I've managed with just heat and charcoal to turn malachite into copper. So we'll let this cool for a second, and then I'll pull it out, and you can actually see that it's metallic.
So we're going to take some tongs now that it's cooled and see if we can get it out of this. There it comes. And there's our little ball of copper. You can sort of see on the back side of it, there's that coppery color. I could take this now with a hammer and beat it out and it would be a, a piece of metal. Okay, so here's our sample of copper that we just made in our crucible and I'm gonna put it on top of this piece of steel and see if I can actually hammer it out. So you can see that I've actually now got a piece of malleable copper. I had to knock off some of the carbon. All right, and so now you could beat this into whatever it is that you wanted to make, say uh, a plow or a scythe or something that could harvest wheat. And then that enabled you then to have hunter gatherers settle down and start living in one place because they could cultivate wheat. All thanks to this one little observation. So the demonstration that you saw is all about how you can turn malachite into copper. Typically it takes about 140 pounds of wood to make just 20 pounds of charcoal, which makes one pound of copper. So it was a very research, resource intensive method of making copper. And so typically that was a strong incentive to recycle copper in ancient times. It was one of the reasons why we actually don't find a lot of artifacts was because they were reused. Now in the smelting process, it's really critical that you have something that can reduce the oxide or sulfide of the copper back down to make copper. Um, and so typically the most common agent we use is carbon monoxide that comes from a burning of charcoal. All right, carbon monoxide wants to be carbon dioxide. And so uh, by mixing your copper ore with a charcoal or carbon source, then you would make the monoxide and you would reduce it back down to copper. Of course, that means that copper in its natural state wants to be in some oxidized or sulfidized state. And so copper is inherently unstable with time. And that's a corrosion property of copper that you need to understand if you're going to use copper in some given application is to recognize that it does want to go back uh, to its oxidized state. Now, why do we call it the Bronze Age and not the Copper Age? Well, Copper itself has a hardness of about 80 megapascals, all right? Bronze, on the other hand, has a hardness of about 170 megapascals. So, and its strength is about three times stronger. So the question obviously comes up is, why is bronze stronger than copper? So in order to understand that, what you have to understand is something we haven't talked about yet, and that is how does a metal deform? So when a metal wants to deform, what happens is, is when I take this piece of metal and I bend it, all right, what I'm actually doing is I am passing what we call a dislocations through the material. Now, what is a dislocation? Um, the usual analogy is um, if you're at your roommate's place and they're moving into their dorm and they say, hey, help me lay out this carpet I got, all right, and you unroll the carpet and you put it on the floor. Now, there's two ways the carpet's not going to fit right on the floor and you need to move it. There's two ways to move it. You can either grab the edge of the carpet and yank it, right, and try to pull it in place. Now, if it's a really big carpet, that's really hard to do, all right? A much easier way to do it is actually, if you're smart, you'll just put a little ripple in the carpet, and then you'll push it with your feet all the way down to the length of the carpet. And when you get to the other end, the carpet will have moved. That little ripple is called a dislocation. And in metals, what happens is that's how they want to plastically deform is that dislocation wants to move through the material from one side to the other, and as it's doing so, I'm actually deforming the material plastically. So, if you want to make something harder, what you have to do is figure out how to slow down those dislocations, those little ripples that are trying to run through the, the metal. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do it. The simplest way to do it is what's called work hardening. That means that what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit it with a hammer, or I'm going to bend it a bunch of times, and if I bend this thing back and forth like this a whole bunch of times, the metal actually becomes harder and harder and harder to bend. So for example, I can demonstrate it with this piece of wire. This is if I take this piece of wire and I bend it, right? And then I bend it back and I bend it again. You'll see that it's actually very hard to bend it in the same place. That hard, that part's become hard. And so now it wants to bend over here. And if I keep bending it, 
the, the bend actually propagates down. So it, it's very hard to bend the material in the same place over and over again because it's becoming very hard. I've got lots of dislocations piling up. They get tangled and that makes it stronger. The same thing happens when you cold roll copper, all right? It will increase its tensile strength. Now, how else could you strengthen it? Well, you could, in addition to work hardening it, you can actually add an impurity. An impurity, what an impurity does is it will actually slow down that dislocation. It gets into the lattice and it messes it up and it makes it hard for that dislocation to propagate through the material. So when I make a bronze, I've added an impurity. Now early on, the most common impurity was arsenic. And then later on, they used tin. Now in, under, in order to understand how much arsenic you could add, you really need to understand what the phase diagram of the material looks like. Now we haven't talked about phase diagrams, so I'm gonna mention it briefly here. A phase diagram is where I'm trying to figure out how much material I can dissolve into another. And the classic case is iced tea, right? You wanna make iced tea, you're gonna to have to figure out how much sugar you can dissolve in it. And here in the South, we dissolve a lot of sugar in our iced tea. So the trick is not to get your iced tea cold and add your sugar. The trick is to take your iced tea while it's hot, add your sugar, and then cool it down, right? So the solubility of sugar in water is higher at higher temperatures, all right? So in order to do that, you can see the space diagram shows that as I add, as I increase the temperature, the liquid lot region, which is where my iced tea plus sugar is solubilized, actually increases with sugar as the temperature goes up. And so, so that's what a phase diagram tells you is how much you can dissolve in, in one material into another and what phases it will form as you cool that material. So here is the copper arsenic bronze phase diagram. And what you'll notice is ignore all this lower stuff. What you can notice is that on one edge I have pure copper and on the other edge I have pure arsenic. As I add arsenic, to my copper, what's happening is the melting point is going down, all right? And that was actually very important because it meant that I could actually melt my bronze at a lower temperature, which made it more accessible, all right? Uh, now, that's if I add arsenic. The same thing happens if I add tin, all right? I can add tin and my melting point goes down. The thing that you'll notice is that blue line indicates where the solubility is. That's how much tin I can dissolve into my copper, like I was dissolving sugar into water. And what it's telling me is I can actually dissolve a lot more tin into my copper than I could arsenic. So that was a real advantage to tin. The other thing is, is that tin is non-volatile. Arsenic is that, well, when you heat it up, will form a gas, right? And so if I added a pound of arsenic to my copper to make a bronze, well, I might wind up with a half a pound of the arsenic coming off as gas. So I never knew how much copper and, and arsenic I had in my mixture, right? And so it was very difficult to make reproducible um, lots of bronze. The second challenge, of course, is that all that arsenic coming off is toxic, right? And so typically people that worked with arsenic were, uh, had a lot of nerve damage from all this arsenic. And so, um, and so we, uh, for example, depict ancient metal workers as oftentimes being physically handicapped from all the arsenic that they were inhaling. So tin was obviously better, it's less toxic. You put a pound of tin in your melt, it's gonna be a pound of tin in your melt. So you knew how to reproduce it. The problem is tin was a lot harder to find. So when we alloy copper with tin, it increases its strength. Here's a graph showing you how the tensile strength increases in copper or bronze as I add more tin. What you'll notice is it increases it up to a point, but then if I add too much tin, the tensile strength drops precipitously, right? And that's because I've entered another phase of bronze that's not desirable. So understanding how much tin was critical if you were an ancient metal worker. Now then, in terms of when it got started, um, the Bronze Age in the Near East happened around 3300 BC, is when we started to see people actually developing and, and fabricating bronze. Um, and it spread to Europe by 3000 BC, and China was 3000 BC, India was 33, so it was very ubiquitous in, in that whole part of Europe and Asia. Um, it didn't actually spread to Japan and Korea until about 500 BC, and it didn't even hit Peru until 100 AD. 
So each region had its own separate Bronze Age. So what were the impacts of bronze, right? Well, the critical thing was, is up until then, you had stone tools, stone implements. So if you wanted to be growing a crop of wheat and harvest that wheat, you had to use a stone or clay scythe, right, to harvest the wheat. And that was very heavy, very cumbersome, and often very brittle, and it would break. And so um, the invention of a bronze that could cut through and harvest meant that I could harvest a whole lot more wheat with that. And that accelerated our ability to actually settle down and quit being hunter-gatherers. Um, there was also a really interesting implication. This copper, right, needed to be alloyed with tin. The question is, is where do I get the copper and where do I get the tin? They don't come from the same areas. And so, interestingly enough, a lot of the early bronzes were made in the Mesopotamia area of, of the eastern part of the Mediterranean. However, the copper was coming from southern Italy, and the tin, surprisingly, was coming from England as far back as 2000 BC, which meant that the impact of bronze was enormous on trade. So you can see, for example, in this map, where the, um, the, this region shows you how the areas de developed, and there was a diffusion of metallurgy, and it started very concentrated in what is present-day Iraq, and that area of the world, and then spread out from there, both to the east and the west. Um, and it didn't actually get into Britain until uh, a fairly decent amount of time afterwards. Now, the, like I said, the important aspect of this thing is where was the tin mine? It's surprising that the Phoenicians would actually go all the way to England to get the tin. And so it, it meant that you had to establish trade routes. And, and what was critical about this, as you'll find out in the reading is that these trade routes were important not only for the standpoint of making bronze but also set up a political structure so you had to have the ability to ensure that you had a safe travel of the material um, in order to uh, ensure that you had a supply of copper and tin to make the bronze. We learned a quite a bit more about copper and bronze with the discovery of Otzi. Otzi was a chalcolithic mummy that was found in 1991 in the Northern Alps when you had a, uh, an ice was actually melting. He'd been under ice for about 5,000 years. He, was, uh, he lived 3,300 BC. And what was interesting about it was he was found carrying a copper axe. So, and that copper axe actually had some arsenic in it. And he had high levels of copper and arsenic in his hair. And so we believe that he was actually from Italy, crossing the Alps, and he was probably worked in the smelting process because of the amount of arsenic that was found in his hair. Early bronzes were quite large. In fact, in 1000 BC, there was a pair of pillars in King Solomon's temple that were 39 feet tall, enormously tall pieces of bronze. However, they no longer exist. And the reason is because every time someone pillaged or conquered that area, the first thing they would do is take all the bronze, cut it up, melt it down, and make the next thing. And so, so you don't have a lot of ancient bronzes because it was very valuable. The bronze was enabled a lot of technologies. So for example, um, it enabled casting technologies for like, production of vessels and arts and tools and weapons. So people learned how to make molds and then pour the bronze into the mold, and then they could mass produce things like scythes or swords or axes or knives. So um, the ability to actually do that was instrumental in the further development of civilizations. Here's an example of a mold from Ireland uh, that was found and was developed somewhere around 900 BC. And it just shows you a sword, a bronze sword that came out of that mold. And so the ability to pour it was critical. This was one of the few metals that was easy, that had the strength necessary to actually perform functions like this, but also had a low enough melting point that you could pour it. For example, you'll find out when we talk about iron that iron had a much higher melting point and made it very difficult to pour.